Sky Howdy, and welcome back to another episode of World Bigfoot Radio. What's going on, everyone? This week with uh, Conspiracy Corner, I'm wearing shades not to uh, look cool, but because I actually have a sty, I would show it to you, but I don't want to gross the audience out. But and I haven't had a sty brand for God, I don't know since I was 12. Oh God! Uh, and I forgot how much they actually hurt. Well, appreciate everyone watching. Appreciate everyone listening. I know this week we uh, decided to kind of step away from the uh, the whole, uh, I guess, gross topics. God, I feel like I've been hit. I feel like I've been in a boxing match. I'm like so freaking swollen right now. Uh, it's hard. It's hard to uh, maybe I'm just self conscious about it. But anyway, uh, I know this week we wanted to talk about giants and giants roaming the earth. And it's interesting when you start looking and you start researching any of these topics. It's fascinating because you start to find more and more and more information that really makes you stop and and wonder what was going on on the planet back in the day. Uh, but I'll let you start off, Brian. What did you find with your research on the Giants? Well, you know, I have to uh, concur with what Wes just said on, on a lot of this stuff. I've been really keeping up with it as it's been coming out. And when I was doing research for this show, I once again found like four or five more things that I hadn't even found previously and had no idea. And, you know, this just connects all over the place. And one of the places that it connects is in... As we started out uh, talking about Phil Schneider and uh, genetic manipulation experiments, and that got us to the uh, Unit 731, this one is about giants, but it also ties in with genetic experiments, eugenics, and uh, basically polluting the uh, DNA of the creatures on Earth. So there's your common thread through all of this sort of stuff. And I guess I think the best way to approach it is to go back to, like, the earliest sources where they talk about giants, and in this case, that would be the uh, the Book of Giants, which was uh, recovered just back in the 20th century from the Dead Sea Scrolls. They got uh, scraps of a lot of uh, versions of this thing, but none of them are completely intact, so they got fragments. So um, these are all found at one place. The Dead Sea Scrolls were found in a cave about a mile inland from the Dead Sea in between 1946 and 52 at Kirbet Qumran on the West Bank. There's between 825 and 870 separate scrolls in this find, and like I said, most of them are fragmentary. Um, according to these, and specifically the Book of Giants, there were 200 fallen angels, also called watchers in some traditions, who came to Earth and performed quote-unquote unnatural acts on humans and animals. The offspring of the Watchers and humans were the Nephilim, or giants, and sometimes called the men of renown. These were the uh, hybrids between the, uh, the fallen angels having uh, relations with human women, like it says in the Bible, uh, Genesis. And then uh, the offspring of that became these giants and, and men of renown. They were apparently, the first generation ones were just ginormously huge. And then as generations went on beyond that, they got progressively smaller and smaller if they were inbreeding with humans. Um, the other thing... It made me wonder, you know, it made me, I don't mean to cut you off, it makes me wonder if some of the women actually died, died in childbirth giving birth to these monsters. Because they had to come out big. Yeah. I mean, you would think they would come out bigger than your normal human being. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it, you know, of course it doesn't say anything about that, but... It's possible that the people that were writing the stories just didn't know what was happening to them. Some of them, it says that they, the, the human women were their wives, so um, you got to wonder what that, you know, what that was all about. But we just don't have that kind of specific information on it. So, yeah, I guess the other issue here is that they weren't just interfering with the uh, human genetic line and polluting that. But it says also in the Book of Giants that they were interfering with, quote, all that grew, fruit of the earth, grains trees, fish, beasts, reptiles, so on and so forth, long list. Um, and the outcome of all of this, together with their hybriding of humans, uh, was of course violence, perversion, and a brood of monstrous beings, not only giants, but horrific chimeras as well. 
and this is mentioned in the Bible in Genesis 6 4. Um, and it, it goes over that again and again in the, the book of Giants, where when the Giants are having a meeting, it talks about the monsters were there also. So the monsters aren't the fallen angels and they're not the Giants. What are they talking about? Yeah, probably some of the freaks of nature that they, the dragons and all the other weird stuff you hear about. Exactly. And if you've got uh, the kind of power to have genetic manipulation, if you've got that kind of science on hand and you want to do things, you know, if you're like 30 feet tall, go ahead and make a monster that's big enough to eat a human. What's it going to do to you? Nothing. Yeah, I think it's interesting, too, as you look back, and I'm sure you're going to get into some of this, but as you look back, historically speaking, I know we talked about Gilgamesh or Nimrod, whatever you, what you guys want to call him. Uh, he, I always wondered for the longest time why the Bible depicted him as, you know, someone God hated, someone God just despised. And it wasn't just, it was more than just, he was a dick. Uh, as you, you read some of these other literature on him, he was a giant. He was a freak of nature. Yep. And that's why, and it's it's when I had Gary Wayne on the show, I know some of the people liked that show, some of the people didn't like the show. But for the longest time, I'd always wonder, when you read about uh, God, for instance, in you know Genesis through you know the 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 Old Testament, he kind of seems like this old grumpy uh, sociopath, alcoholic. I mean, the worst of the worst, because he just is so angry when when they go into the land of Canaan. He says, "Wipe everyone out: women, children, beasts. Wipe them all out." And he is he is merciless when he does it. And in, I always wondered for the longest time, God, why was God so merciless? Uh, like Jericho, the people of Jericho were terrified of the Israelites. They wanted nothing to do with the Israelites. Mm -hmm. And they went in, God went in, and they meant every man, woman, child, beast of the field was wiped out. And so you see these giants appear before the flood and after the flood. But it goes beyond even that. You know, when I, as I was researching this, like the Egyptian and some of the paintings that they have, it's giants building the pyramids. And it's so obvious they're giants because they show normal human beings next to these freaks. And you see it in the Sumerian culture, you see it in the Aztec culture, you see it in the Native American culture. Um, even uh, Wild Bill or Buffalo Bill, what was it uh, William Cody Case that put it up on the blog? He wrote in his biography about a Native American talking to him about these redheaded giants, mm. how they would run with the buffalo and just scoop them right up in their arms, mm. which sounds crazy until you see the, the stone carving of Gilgamesh holding a lion in his arms like a little kitten. Um, yeah. But I didn't mean to go off on a rampage on you. No, you're absolutely right, though. It's, I'm like, ah, that, giants! <laughs> giants are cool. Yeah, that I know the, the carving that you're talking about, and that is a full-grown lion. You can look at the carving, and it's got a mane on it. It's not some little kitten or something. He's holding a full-grown lion. Um, so, yeah, that gives you the proportion and scale. And Gilgamesh and Nimrod, uh, according to uh, historical researchers and uh, archaeologists and whatnot, are starting to think that they were the same person because they're given sort of the same, uh, you know, Uruk was built by uh, Nimrod, while supposedly also built by Gilgamesh. Uh, Babylon, the Tower of Babel, uh, was built by Nimrod, but also supposedly by Gilgamesh. So, um, you know, there's sort of these, people are thinking that they're the same person. And Gilgamesh is also supposed to have been one of those, uh, I think it was a second generation, either first or second generation hybrid with the uh, the fallen ones, the Watchers, so he had that same bloodline going on too. Now you're talking about the the giants being all over the place. Well, let's get let's go back for a minute now. The giants had polluted the earth with their DNA. They had managed to get their DNA into most of the human bloodlines. They had tampered with all the animals and everything. And some people even think this includes things like dinosaurs not actually being uh, natural animals but being manipulated with by the Nephilim and made into these, you know, giant monsters due to their DNA manipulations. So God says, okay, that's it. The only way I can deal with this is to take the, the few animals and people that still have, uh, you know, clean DNA with them, put them all on the ark and, uh, and save them. So Noah, go ahead, 
make this big arc, you know, take care of this whole project, and then I'm going to flood the world and kill them. Well, meanwhile, on the giant side, according to the Book of Giants, they're actually getting warnings about this. Um, some of the, the uh, Titans, which are what they were calling the first generation hybrids, were having dreams and stuff about this. And one of them, uh, one of the Nephilim, named Mahwe, uh, he was a Titan son of Barakel, had a vision of a stone tablet being immersed in water. When it was drawn forth again, all the names on it were gone except three names. And this is taken as a prophecy of something bad that was happening. Uh, and then another giant, Oya, uh, also had a disturbing dream. This one about a tree being uprooted and uh, tipped over and only three of the roots still holding it to the ground. So they decide that they need to get a hold of the most famous uh, prophet and dream interpreter that they can find, who in this case happens to be Enoch, who's the great grandfather of Noah. And Enoch at this point isn't even on the earth. He's after his 365 years, and it says in the Bible that God took him. It doesn't say he died. So he's gone somewhere. And uh, Mahwe has to actually fly to wherever it is that he's gone to, to go find him and get this dream interpreted. And Enoch doesn't come back with him, but through intermediaries, he sends a tablet that's got God's verdict on it. And Enoch tells them that it's a warning from God to repent or be destroyed, including the Watcher's wives and all of their offspring. Now, at this point, apparently they don't do enough repenting because shortly after that, uh, God sends down four archangels to go after him. Michael, Gabriel, Israel, and Raphael. Um, and the first thing they do is they trick one of the giants into stealing one of the other giant's wives and sets off a war between the giants and a lot of them wipe each other out. Um, then uh, after that, the giants have wiped most, most of each other out. The uh, big flood happens and wipes out presumably the remainder of them. Except, if you look at the Bible, it says... In, the, the, there were giants in the earth in those days. It doesn't say on the earth. It says in the earth. This is an important point because Noah and his daughters and their husbands, uh, that whole family, there's one of them, I think Ham was the one that's got some uh, Nephilim pollution in his bloodline, but they're pretty much pure otherwise. They are you know don't have any of that uh, DNA pollution on them. But somehow the giants again appear after the flood, and, and according to the other apocryphal books, it was uh, Og, uh, Og, excuse me, of Bashan, who had survived it somehow. And my guess is by being underground, because giants live in the earth. He just happened to be down there when the flood happened. He was the only one that survived it. He comes out again, uh, according to these sources that say he lived for five thousand years. So he was the one that began repopulating the giants in Canaan. Uh, Bashan is in Canaan. So by the time after all this other stuff happened and the Jews finally got to Canaan, this area had been entrenched with giants living there for centuries. They had completely taken over this area. And uh, so when God sent the Israelites in there to take over that area, it was not only promised to them, but he also had the ulterior motive of, well, here's the last spot where giants are on earth that survived the flood, wipe them out. And since they've had animals and all this other stuff around, wipe them out too because they polluted the DNA on that, more than likely. They like to tamper with DNA, wipe them out too. So what's the next thing that happens? Well, you, then you start getting these reports, uh, historical reports and archives from there being giants on Sardinia, which apparently was their next stop. Then they went into Europe, everywhere that you, you find these giant mounds and megaliths. If you talk to the locals, they'll say, well, we didn't make them, the giants built them. And of course, the modern day archeologists and whatnot say, well, that's ridiculous, there were no giants. This is just some culture that was around before that they have no record or remaining uh, you know, racial knowledge of, uh, no passed down uh, legends about or anything, so they don't know about them. So they're just saying the giants built it. Well, no, what if giants actually built it? Because they're big enough to move these giant stones around with no effort at all. And with what it'd be just about impossible for us with Stone Age technology. And according to even the archaeologists, the megaliths in Europe and in the Mediterranean are older the further south that you go. So they started out around the Mediterranean and moved north. So then you get up into the lands where you've got the, uh, the frozen Arctic lands of the Swedes, the Norwegians, the Danes, the Finns, 
you all have this legendary about Odin and Thor and everything, and their um, legends talk about the frost giants that they were warring with. Well, what are the frost giants like? Well, they've got blue eyes, they've got white skin, and they've got long red hair. And they're extremely fierce, right. they kill humans, and they eat them. So what's the next thing that you see? Indian legends from North America about the white skin, red haired giants that were running around eating people. And these were all the same people that were building the mounds over here. And then it goes into South America. As soon as the, uh, the Israelites went after them over there, what was left, and probably the ones that had left before that, had already spread all over the world. So these things had gone everywhere at that point. And once again, there are giants in the earth. Yeah, it's interesting. It's really, really interesting, especially, you know, for the longest time when I, I grew up, uh, they used to say that the flood didn't happen. It's impossible. So I, I remember scientists in the 80s saying that there was there's no evidence of a global flood. And now all of a sudden there's evidence of a global flood. And the same thing with these giants. All of a sudden you start looking at historical accounts, you know, from about 1880 to about 1930 something. There is newspaper articles of people digging up giants, even here in, in North America, mm -hmm. digging them up, farmers digging them up. Yeah. And from about, the, I would say, early 40s, somewhere around that time, someone put the kibosh on the whole thing. Either people quit digging them up or someone was kind of silencing people digging up these giants. But you can read these accounts, account after account after account. And what's interesting is even in the Middle East, you can read accounts of farmers digging up these huge, gigantic bones. Yep. Um, and it, it's, um, it's worldwide. And, I, you know, it's hard for us to believe that there was a worldwide flood. But I think pre-flood, what we assume to be our human history probably isn't even close no. to what was actually going on. And the technology that was going on and that, you know, the uh, Europeans, you know, weren't, well, the Native Americans probably weren't the first one here on North America. It's probably these giants running around because you hear farmers digging these things up. Yeah. And even today, you know, you and I have talked about mountain giants and I've spoken with a, cu a couple people that have claimed to have seen these mountain giants and they describe them as way out of proportions for Sasquatch, too big to be a Sasquatch. And then the features they mention sound human, mm -hmm. but, but just the size is just so far out that it's hard to place it. What is your take on some of these ma modern day mountain giant stories? Do you think it's the Nephilim? I'm not sure if they're directly related because the description is off a little bit. Um, one thing that we should post is a picture that they accidentally got of apparently a giant in the forest over in Bulgaria where this group of uh, students were just marching up this mountain and somebody took a picture of the students and way off in the background they've got this thing in the shot. You can, There's like two or three pictures right in sequence where you can see this thing in the background. And uh, again, it looks like about 20 feet tall. It's built more or less like a basketball player. And um, that's the, you know, the description for most of the, the red-haired giants over here in North America was seven to nine feet. Reference book on this, free plug here. The Giants That Ruled America and the Smithsonian Cover-Up by Dewhurst. This is the book on this whole subject. Nice and thick. First 150 pages is nothing but reprints from old newspaper articles here in the U.S. of giant bones being recovered and the people doing the studies on them, uh, take, you know, taking uh, measurements of how big they were and where they were found and the whole thing. And then, of course, all the stories end with, and then the people from the Smithsonian came and took the bones away for further study. Case after oh. case after case after case, 150 pages of it. And that's all they just bothered to get. I'm sure there's more. Uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, the Smithsonian, according to these guys, and I totally believe this, since they do work for the government, uh, don't want anything contradicting the theory of evolution and everything that modern science runs on. So they're more than happy to go ahead, and they've had this policy in place. I'd have to read the book again. It's got the name of the specific Smithsonian director that started all of this uh, in the late 1800s. And basically after that point, it was like, if you find giant bones or anything, get them, bring them here, and you know, whatever happens after that point, we don't know. 
but they're never seen again. And they always say, oh, we lost them. And, you know, or they dumped them in the Atlantic, whatever. It doesn't jive with the story that they want to put out. Um, and that isn't just here in the U.S. That's in lots of other um, places around the world where they're sort of tied into that whole academic scientific community because anything, you know, like, oh, you found a giant, you guys are crazy, you're not even scientists, ha, ha, ha. And, you know, everybody's got that attitude. So if they're going to be working together with the other academic scientists from around the world, they sort of got the same goofball attitude that anything they find that's outside the range of what we find acceptable and believable has to be discarded or automatically we're going to say it's a hoax. Yeah, I think there is some sort of a cover-up going on. Uh, it's kind of like, and most people tend to forget this, but uh, before 9-11 happened, what was it, the day before 9-11 happened, they were like, oh, uh, hey, by the way, there's a whole bunch of missing money, and we don't know what happened to it. And it was a very large sum of missing money. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, 9-11 happens, and no one ever talks about it again. And what's interesting is I didn't realize they had found Nimrod's tomb in Iraq. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, this is actually uh, pretty stunning. As of um, April 23rd, 2003, they reported on the BBC that they had uh, found the of Nimrod, who was also Gilgamesh, and uh, the founder of Uruk. And because they had found through uh, satellite magnetic uh, ground anomaly mapping, they had found the actual ruins of Uruk. And they uh, went there and started digging around, and they were trying to figure out where the Euphrates had formerly run because it ran right next to or through the town. And when they found the former course of the Euphrates, it occurred to them that according to the um, description of where he had been buried, that when Nimrod slash Gilgamesh finally died and they buried him, they diverted the course of the river, buried him under the Euphrates, and then re-diverted it back to where it flowed so nobody could get to his tomb. It was underneath the Euphrates. Well, that was you know, 45, 5,000 years ago. So he's gone. Uh, the Euphrates has changed course and isn't there anymore. So they, once they figured out where it was, it was easy enough to dig in there. And uh, if I got right here within one month of the time that they dug in there, 2003, uh, a German expedition found it. And John Fassbender of the Bavarian Department of Historic, Histor, Historical Monuments in Munich uh, is the one that said the tomb matched the description of the last resting place of Gilgamesh. Um, so at this point, now we have to go into some stuff that Steve Quayle likes to talk about. If he claims that part of the reason that we had the Gulf War invasion of Iraq was for a cover story, because uh, the name Iraq, by the way, came from the word Uruk, which was the city that Nimrod slash Gilgamesh found it. <clears throat> One of the primary objectives and reasons for us being there is that they had opened up his tomb, and that they figured that he still had some of this ancient uh, technology hidden in his tomb, and also he was the Nephilim giant, so they wanted to get his remains to hide it from the outside world science and also so they could probably get DNA from it because that's, you know, first or second generation Nephilim right there. Uh, <clears throat> so if, you know, they didn't have giants already available, they can bring them back that way. And the other thing that's kind of hilarious is Bush saying, well, we got to go over into Iraq because there's, there's weapons of mass destruction there. It could be nuclear, biological, or chemical. Yeah, well, it's biological and it's a Nephilim DNA. There's your weapon of mass destruction. Yeah, it's interesting. It makes you wonder what they're going to do with it. You know, we have the technology for DNA, and we've talked about it on past shows. So we don't have to go into it again, but uh, the amount of DNA testing they're doing, genetics they're doing, and experiments they're doing, I think would shock most of the general public on what's actually going on. I think a lot of people actually think we're a lot more protected from this than what we actually are. Um, when I was doing research for this, I found out that the U.S. Patent Office has actually issued a patent for creating chimeras. That's right, half-human, half-animal DNA hybrids. Somebody's got a patent for it. That's, that's yeah, public sector, buddy, if they got a patent for it. What is the military and everybody else doing with it? Because they've had it for 30, 40 years at least. Yeah. And, you know, like I said, the and that's been protected. 
chimeras are protected in Europe right now. Mm -hmm. uh, so it makes you wonder what is going on. It's kind of like that whole Nephilim that was killed in Afghanistan, you know, where the soldiers went in and they kept saying this thing was eating soldiers while well, they finally chased it to a cave and lit the thing up. And there's several witnesses that saw this thing, mm -hmm. said it was this huge giant that ate people. Uh, this is modern day, too. This isn't something from biblical records. This just happened, what, a couple of years back, didn't it? Yeah, this, is, this is the Afghan war here just recently, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think a lot of things that uh, are hidden in plain sight are sort of, you know, even the, the people that are, like, staunchly Christian that know the Bible inside and out, I don't think have a really clear idea of how much talk there is of the giants and the Nephilim bloodlines in there. And I... I can give you guys an example. There's actually 21 giants are spoken of by name in the Bible, including uh, Og of Bashan. Now, his father, Og's father, was named Ogius. And the actual real name of the Book of Giants is, in fact, Book of Ogius. And in the Western English, Ogius has been brought down and translated to us as the word ogre. So technically, for our way of thinking, modern English, it would be direct translation book of ogres uh, what do ogres do they're monsters that eat people okay uh, King Nimrod again is another one of the giants now a lot of this isn't directly in the Bible because they took out some of these books when they made the whole canon uh, back in the third century the uh, with Constantine uh, forcing them to do it and they left out some of the stuff that relates to giants so when you read the Bible, you get the names of all these different tribes and, and peoples that the Israelites are having conflicts with, but you don't realize that some of the stuff behind the conflicts has to do with their bloodline. Let me give you some examples. All of these different tribes and peoples that they mention in the following list all have Nephilim blood in them or are pure-blooded Nephilim. Okay? Amalekites, Amorites, Anakims, Ashtothites, Avims, Avites, Canaanites, Kaphtarims, Ekronites, Emmons, Eshkelonites, Gazathites, Geshurites, Gibeonites, Giblites, Girgashites, Gidits, Hittites, Hivites, Horims, Horites, Gebusites, Cadmonites, Kenites, Kenizites, Maachinites, Manassites, Nephilim, Perizzites, Philistines, Rephaim, Sidonians, Zamzimins, Zebushites, and Zuzims. That's 35 tribes. So yeah. giants are all over the damn place in the Bible if you know what you're looking at. Yeah, and it's interesting too because it's, like I said before, you always thought that God was just kind of uh, reckless and kind of angry. and uh, But, you know, and it's and those, those the ones you mentioned, like the Amorites, all the Hittites, these people just kind of magically show up after the flood. That's the other thing, too. Yeah. Is everything in the Bible is bloodline based. You know, Enoch, all the way down to Methuselah, all the way to Noah, all the way to Abraham. Everything's bloodline. You can figure out where someone came from. And after the flood, there was no one. It was Noah and his sons. And But what's interesting is all these other tribes start showing up. All these other people start showing up. And they never really explain where they came from. And so uh, it makes me wonder, you know, it says in the the end of days, it'll be like the days of Noah. It makes me wonder if uh, we're going to start seeing this more and more and more and more. Uh, these things start reappearing like they were back in the day. Yeah, genetically created monstrosities. Now, the other thing to, to think about, too, is that, you know, like you were saying, uh, that's one thing that always kind of threw me, too. In the Old Testament, God's like this big meanie. And then uh, all of a sudden Jesus comes along and he's a God of love and peace and wants everybody to get along. It's like, what, did he mellow mel out after he had a kid or what's going on here? And, yeah. you know, it's like <laughs> that had nothing to do with it. He's the same God the whole time. What, what it was was just this, this bloodline of these monsters that were created by the fallen angels. And the fallen angels, of course, work for the devil, God's enemy. So he doesn't want the devil's people to take over his creation, his world. He's trying to wipe them out. And he was using the Israelites as his uh, instrument for doing that in some of these cases. And, you know, letting them basically work for what they're... Here's a beautiful land. Go wipe out these nasty giants. You can have it. We can't fight these guys. We're like the size of crickets compared to them. Hey, don't worry. I'll, I'll, I'll teach you some good methods of getting rid of them. <laughs> you know, whatever. They don't right. talk about that. But 
uh, <clears throat> they ended up winning it. But the other thing to think about now is uh, the Tower of Babel. We get back to Nimrod Gilgamesh. Supposedly, he's the guy that was building this. They were making this tall tower so that they could ascend into the heavens and be with God. Well, you know, we know from modern day that if you build really tall towers, God isn't going to come down and smite you. I mean, when we built the Twin Towers in New York, God didn't have like a hissy fit and come down and throw a lightning bolt at him. So it didn't have anything to do with the height of the building. What I think they were actually talking about here is that, again, there was this fallen angel technology involved, and they were making some kind of a stargate inside of this huge building so that they could go to different places that God didn't want them going to. And so that's why he came down and went, well, that's it for that experiment. We're going to make the tower fall down. We're going to make everybody have different uh, uh, languages so they all go wander around somewhere else and don't talk to each other and organize anymore because they're just going to be too much of a problem here. And, uh, you know, again, one of the reasons for wiping out the giants. You know, it's, it's interesting. That I know that sounds like crazy talk to a lot of people, but if you read, like, the Book of Enoch, what was interesting about the Book of Enoch, and, and it, they don't even really explain it that well in the Book of Enoch, but the fallen angels go back to Enoch, and they say, hey, you know, for some reason God seems to like you. Can you go before God and, right. you know. They want him to intercede on their behalf. Yeah, they know he's grease the wheels. Yeah, they know he's yeah, yeah. he's like really tight with God. They're like you know, yeah, like that. And they, but what's interesting is is uh, it, there was somewhere in that conversation he was having with these fallen angels, and he was saying, "How can I go before God?" And they were saying, "We'll show you how to go before God." Uh huh. And he ended up before God. He ended up, I think, it, somewhere in the Book of Enoch. He he's somewhere in heaven. And they don't really explain how he gets there, but, you know, an angel comes to him and is like, what are you doing here? You shouldn't be here. Uh -huh. And he has to speak to God. And so it makes you wonder if there were, you know, I think all these stories, and I hate to go too much into the Bible because I know some people really curse that, but <laughs> like the book of Adam and Eve, it's very, very fascinating to read the book of Adam and Eve, mm -hmm. the whole story. They talk about this light being on their body like clothes. So the whole Stargate stuff, you know, I I don't think that it's uh, with that technology. I don't I mean to sound like Matthew Johnson, but I think when you start getting wrapped up with these fallen angels and you start getting wrapped up with these evil entities, they have power and they have technology based on based way beyond anything and we could imagine. Right. And that's why I think the pre-flood world was a very technology advanced world. You're right. What there's no reason for God to destroy. Um, what was it Nimrod was building? The Tower, uh, of, the Tower Babel. of Babel. Yeah. There was no reason for it. But all of a sudden he wipes it out. And the one thing he said that always stuck with me is if you read in the Bible and also Sumerian texts talk about it too as well. God said there's nothing they couldn't accomplish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, once they got a well, Stargate, they can pretty much go anywhere and then gather up any technology and cause any kind of problem. Right, and that always stuck with me. There, there's nothing they can't accomplish. Well, what is he talking about there? What do you mean there's nothing they can't accomplish? Um, so it makes you wonder what, what technology they have. It, there's so much of this stuff that they just go right over it so fast, you know, like where it talks about the one passage about giants in Genesis, and then that's pretty much it. There's some little passages right. after that. I mean, if you guys want to go actually try and find them, Second Samuel 21, Genesis 6, First Chronicles 20, Deuteronomy 1.28. I mean, you know, there's some of the places in the Bible where they mention giants, but it's like they don't go in depth on some of this stuff. And if you read some of the um, apocryphal books that were included in the canon, all these books tie together. They, they've all got yeah, like do. a little piece of the story in it. Like you're talking about um, Enoch somehow getting in front of God. Well, if you read the book of giants, Mahwe went to find Enoch and said, please intercede, go talk to God, see what's going on. And again, like you said in the book of Enoch, he goes, I don't know how to get there. How do I go talk to God? Oh, oh I'll show you. Well, yeah, he flew there <laughs> flew there with them, basically, took them there. And that's why the angel said, what are, you, what are you doing here? How'd you get here? Yeah. And it's just fa that the whole thing fascinates me and the whole story of the giants fascinate me. You know, and, and today we call it ancient aliens, or if you ever watch a history channel, they call it ancient aliens. Like, I guess it's more of a new age uh, term or for people who don't read the Bible or right. take the time to read any of these other books, it's easier to say, well, it's aliens. But 
You're right. And even in the Bible, it mentions by name, like the book of Jasper mm -hmm. um, or the book of um, there's another one they, they mention. But there's stuff taken out of all these apocryphal books that are actually in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And if, if people get a chance, read the book of Enoch. It's probably one of the most fascinating books I've ever read because he describes. I think there's a reason why they didn't include it in the Bible. And the reason is this names are very important in the Bible. If you notice that yep. when they mention someone by name, it's the, it's of great importance that they're mentioning that name in the book of Enoch. He names off the fallen angels. And I think that's why it wasn't included in the original canons because names are important. They, you know, you don't want to make these, make them infamous. You don't want to make them famous. You yeah. know what I mean? Well, and the other thing is, too, names ha allow you to have control. As you read the whole story of Solomon, he got this magic ring from God that let him control these demons. So as soon as he found out what their names were and what uh, the the specifics on the uh, summing uh, conjuration of them were, he could call these things up and command them to do things, which, according to the story, he did to build uh, temples and all sorts of things. He just made them do the dirty work. Which is <laughs> kind of a dirty trick, but along the same lines, you don't want any of these lesser magicians to get the names of one of these things, summon it up, and then not be able to control it and have it go loose and start destroying everything. Now, remember, part of the story from the Book of Giants is that after the 200 fallen ones came down here and started having human wives and making hybrids, their punishment was that they would watch the deaths of their wives and their children. And what happened is they were imprisoned in the earth. So all 200 of them are imprisoned in the earth. And they were supposed to be there, which, you know, watching the, the demise of their wives and children. It means even though they're in prison, they still have the psychic powers to be able to you know, astrally project or see what's going on in the surface or whatever. But they just can't get out and be loose. Which makes me wonder about what, if there's any tie-in with things like CERN. You know, are they trying to find the particles that's, that uh, created the universe? Or are they trying to open the gates to let these things loose again? There's some people that do stuff on that, too, and that's another really creepy conspiracy. Well, the interesting part about the Book of Giant, or with the whole story, is they were bound to the Earth for 70 generations. Right. And what the heck does that mean? And then they'd be let loose. And what's the 70 generations mean? And the other thing that ties into it is the deep underground bases we were talking about, mm -hmm. or what was going on in Antarctica, you know, when they went and did the expedition. Uh, that was just on the History Channel the other day when you and I were talking about Antarctica. There was something weird going on there. They sent that expedition. This is way off topic, but they sent this expedition to Antarctica. Operation High Jump, 1946. When you speak of the resources of Antarctica, what are they? What, uh, what are the natural resources there? Well, uh, we've found enough of coal within 180 miles of the South Pole in a great uh, ridge of mountains it's not covered with snow enough to supply the whole world for quite a while well uh, that's that's the coal now there's evidence of uh, other many other minerals uh, we are pretty sure there's oil now that coal shows the bottom of the world now by far the coldest spot in the world where that coal is gets 100 below zero in the winter well uh, it was once tropical so uh, we think there's oil there and there's evidence Probably uranium there. Uh, are, are, are there that many expeditions now there or en route there? Uh, well, you know, as I said, it's the most peaceful place in the world, but I don't think it will be for long because of this intense interest on the part of, uh, of other nations and this nation. Our distinguished guest was Admiral Richard E. Byrd. Why did the Allies under Admiral Byrd mount an invasion of the Antarctic? Uh, having seen uh, the film that was made in 1947 with Admiral Byrd and uh, Admiral Wood, I had the opportunity to actually see portions of this film. And what struck me was the fact that there was a significant military contingent that went down to Antarctica with Admiral Byrd. Why was it necessary to bring some 4,000 uh, soldiers uh, a battleship, an aircraft carrier, and a support team to go into an area that was purely a geological slash geophysical exploration. Clearly, there were other unknown factors there, and it was 
up to the Americans to see if they could uh, acquire this missing technology. That is one scenario. After a few days, however, and the loss of an undisclosed number of aircraft, the operation was abruptly terminated. What happened? What mysterious opponent could have repelled the Allied invasion so quickly and decisively? Could it have been the few remaining members of the German armed forces? It is clear that under the structures of ice, there are many layers of civilization suggesting at one earlier point of time when the conditions of the South Pole were different. Clearly, there was some type of civilization there. This, of course, is assuming that the shell of the Earth had a different north and south magnetic pole. And with the shifting of the pole, this region became suddenly very, very frigid. And thus, we do not see any evidences on the surface of these so-called earlier conditions of intelligence. However, I believe with the further exploration of the documents that both Admiral Byrd brought to the attention of the world after World War II, and the Brazilian Navy uncovered in 1961 with its subpole expedition that extraterrestrial intelligence is also operated out of the area of the South Pole. They had a naval armada of 5,000 men, including Australians and British and Australian and British ships. They also had Admiral Nibbets, and the overall commander was Admiral Byrd, who was a polar expert. Why do you send something like that to the South Pole to do, you know, search? an expedition? Yeah. Biggest, yeah. biggest expedition ever mounted to the South Pole, and it's all naval military. What? You know, what worries me, though, is when you start reading, like, the Phil Snyder stories, they're going down how many miles into the Earth and running into these weird beings. Mm. It makes you, makes you, ties back and makes you wonder if they're running into the stuff pre-Noah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, and then there's other weird tie-ins with that, too. I was just looking at a video the other day where they've been doing uh, subsurface uh, satellite imaging of the actual land underneath the giant ice cap at, in Antarctica and taking a look at what's underneath it. And they're finding structures there. Um, and this is like under a mile and a half, two miles of ice. So either that was actually there before this whole ice sheet came and, and covered up the area, which according to modern science is ridiculous and impossible, uh, but there it is. So either that's, they're completely wrong about how old Antarctica is and uh, how long it's been covered with ice, or somebody else has gotten underneath the ice and made a civilization underneath there which ties in with the whole weird story of Base 211 at the South Pole and Admiral Dernitz of the uh, German Navy uh, crowing about them having actually built an impregnable fortress for the Fuhrer uh, in the, you know, a Shangri-La where no one can get to them. There you go. Yeah. One of the things that really got me is they were showing these subsurface scans and I'm looking at them and I'm going, oh my God, that's a swastika. There's a perfect swastika there. Really? Yep. That's interesting. Oh, that's creepy, man. All right, welcome back, everyone, to the latest episode of World Bigfoot Radio. We have a returning guest showing up here tonight, which is Dave the Exorcist. And after the uh, last episode that I did with him, <laughs> we had a bunch of... Uh, people that were uh, you know, asking more questions and that just wanted more information on some of the stuff we were talking about. And I figured that since he's done a bunch of research on this, I've done a bunch of research on it, and uh, a bunch of my you know, people that follow what I've been doing will remember that about a year ago, me and Wes did an episode for Conspiracy Corner on the history of the Giants, and we sort of ended up like right after the flood. Well, what we, me and Dave are going to do tonight is we're going to pick it up right there and bring her up to present here, and we're specifically going to be talking about how the Giants got over to North America, where they may have come from, uh, you know, how they spread around, what time it may, you know, dates approximate, really approximate dates, uh, when any of this stuff may have been happening, and uh, we're going to try and tie it all together and give you guys uh, a history of the Giants from the Levant up to the uh, Giants of the Wild Wild West. And so that's what we're doing tonight. Now, for those of you who didn't hear the original show or may have forgotten parts of it, we were talking about the uh, Nephilim, 
the uh, which are mentioned not only in the Old Testament, Genesis 6, and also in Numbers, but they're also mentioned uh, a lot in the apocryphal books, uh, Jubilees, Jasher, uh, Enoch, and of course the book of Ogius, uh, book of the the giants, which uh, Og, king of Bashan's dad, supposedly wrote, so written by a giant even, um, and so that was the the source information we used to cover a lot of that stuff back uh, in the in the original episode, and we talked about um, the culture we talked about because of their massive size that a lot, if not all, of the megalithic structures that we see on the face of the earth at this point are basically leftovers that were made by them before the flood, and that could be up to and including the Great Pyramids. Uh, we just were talking a couple days ago about this one uh, video that you can look at on YouTube where they went inside the uh, tomb of the royal architect who actually built a lot of these monuments and whatnot um, during the time this was going on. There was a lot of major construction over there in the, the Nile uh, Valley. And on all of these, uh, the inside of his tomb, of course, you know, he's rich, so richly decorated tomb. There's all these beautiful murals that show, well, there's giants moving these rocks around. There's little humans that are carving them, but there's these huge giants moving all this stuff around. So, <clears throat> you know, it seems like there's a pretty clear link there, too. And then also there's the um, link with the Peruvian, the pra uh, Praca skulls that uh, Ron Moorhead is doing stuff on, L.A. Marzulli is involved with. They supposedly got uh, a piece of one of them to check for DNA, and it turned out to be non-human. Um, where the insertion for the spinal cord is is in the wrong place on the skull. The uh, skull has a greater internal volume than uh, a human skull has. There's just too many anomalies on it for it to be considered a human skull. Now, when Marzulli had it, and he had a... A medical expert looking at it. One of the first things the medical expert said is that the subject here must have been a creature with a very long neck because of where the insertion for the spinal cord was, it would have had to have had a long neck to hold its head up in the right position. And LA immediately went, bing, there's this light bulb above his head going off. He has got a picture of that. Bing, oh my God, long necks. That's a direct translation of the word anakim, which is one of the sub varieties of the Nephilim. And if you look at the depictions of King Tut and his father, Akhenaten, they also had that same weird anomaly to their physiology. So they were at least part, if not completely, Nephilim. So there was like a huge Nephilim connection with Egypt, and we're going to be talking about that in a lot greater depth here. So just to keep, you know, keep in mind now that we're talking about after the flood. Before the flood, the giants, and, you know, I think... Um, tribes that were still existing after the flood that had some of their bloodlines were referred to them as Nephilim tribes, and, and some of those were hybrids. Some of them may have looked a lot like humans and just had like a little bit of Nephilim blood, but they were still contaminated, so they were considered to be Nephilim. So Nephilim, you know, all were all the giants Nephilim? Probably. Are all Nephilim giants? No. And the other thing is that the flood was God's way of getting rid of these abominations so he could start over with a clean, a clean slate, uh, basically, because they had been using their abilities, whether magical or genetically manipulating, to create these awful, monstrous hybrids, not only these enormous giants that were eating humans, but also chimeras, other types of monsters, and, you know, would presume uh, subservient races that were doing their uh, dirty work for them. You know, they may have even been involved with... Uh, engineering uh, things like dinosaurs. We just don't know. But um, so at the time that all this was going on, God's wrath was great. There was a huge uh, disaster on the earth. The waters of the deep broke up and the waters of the sky started raining down. Massive flood. Everything gets wasted and the big giants are all gone. Now, all the giants before the flood are called Nephilim, but after the flood, they're not called that anymore. Now, the Nephilim doesn't mean giant. It means fallen ones. And after the flood, they're called Rephaim, which means risen ones, but it carries a connotation that's really spooky that sort of makes you think they're talking about them being walking dead. And there's other things connected to the accounts of them after the flood that sort of even bring this point home a little bit stronger than just that uh, appellation right there. But before I get any too much further on with just blabbing on endlessly, I want to bring my guest Dave on. Hey, Dave, great, great to have you back on the show, man. Thanks a lot. 
I appreciate Always it. a pleasure to have you here, brother. Yeah, so like I said, we had already done this show on the, on the early parts of the whole history of the Giants, where they came from, what they were, how they were pretty much ruling the earth and had you know done their best to mess everything up and got smote and wiped out well, as a result yeah. of it. Let, let's talk about why the devil was doing all this. That, that, you know, the, the, the question that, that I would have at the beginning of hearing about this stuff, and that's the question that I really thought out, is what in the heck was all this stuff about? Mm-hmm. And of course, the the New Testament had not been written, and you know the the Old Testament hadn't even been written at that time. And uh, but the devil pretty much knew that God was going to do something. He'd gotten a prophecy from Adam concerning Adam and Eve about uh, you know he'd bruise the the foot of, of the heir of of Eve, and 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 uh, he, that heir would bruise his head. Mm-hmm. So he knew there was something coming in From the future. Yeah. And his his goal today, and for any of those folks that are monitoring this show, you need to hear this too. His goal today was the same as his goal then, to get the earth so polluted with corrupt DNA that God would give up and not come back. Because the only thing that he understood about God was was angry and vengeful. Uh-huh. But that's not the God that has reached out to humanity. And the he had already created Hades, the underworld, hell, and the lake of fire for them. They knew their future was not going to be good and that they were already damned. And his whole MO is to say it now that he, especially now that because he knows the Bible, now that he knows his end is the lake of fire, his whole M.O. is to so corrupt the gene pool on planet Earth so that God gives up and walks away. Mm-hmm. Because that's his only, only hope. And that's what all of this stuff, with all the things that we're hearing about UFOs, all of the stuff about the giants, especially when you look at the Septuagint, which once the the, uh, the 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 priests and Pharisees had walked out and given themselves up to Alexander the Great, and they became a part of the Egyptian Empire on his march out to Egypt, uh, they thought, well, we need to to have our Bible, our Holy Word in Greek because we need to have ourselves represented in the Greek government, and we needed documents that are in Greek, and so they paid. Now, this is several hundred years before the book of Malachi, I believe, or or at least uh, before the New Testament. They had uh, their entire holy word translated into Greek, and that's called the Septuagint Bible. And it is the most accurate Translation, it's in Greek, but it's been translated by several several folks into into English over the years. And these and are the series of the early books that are supposedly ascribed to uh, Moses writing them, correct? Well, and the prophets. This is the whole Old Testament. Okay. Uh, now, at the time, it didn't include the book of Daniel because it was written in the Chaldean language, and most of the Jews to this day don't know what's in the book of Daniel because it's not part of their tradition, even though it's in their Bible. But it talks about, in the Septuagint, in the 13th chapter of Isaiah, that he's going to send the giants to perform his wrath at a future date. Now, this is this happened in the year somewhere around uh, 200 to 0 B.C. And... Uh, this is a serious deal. He's going, he said, Behold, I'm going to quote it just from memory. Behold, I'll send the giants to perform my wrath. They shall come amusing, but then they shall be hideous or something like that. And then at the bottom, in the last verse of it, he's talking about satyrs coming. So these things are going to come from somewhere. And the the folks that are are using terminology you know they're 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 kind of turned off by using the words portal and stargate and all this kind of stuff even though those are the words the native americans are using and have been using for a long time especially the four corners area 
Yeah. But we just call it an opening in the spirit realm. Mm-hmm. Now, where that these things are more than likely these things are are the undead. Well, there there's going to be something spooky happen in the future, folks. You know, as Marzulli says, when we go up, they 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 come down. Yeah. And and uh, there's and going again, to be. We don't know how much of the how how direct this translation is. They could literally be saying that the giant's bodies that you see are the dead giants that have been raised that they're going to, black yeah, they're, magic. They're going to resurrect. I mean, that's that's exactly yeah. what it's implying. There's no mm-hmm. there's no ambiguity at all. They are going to show up either through some kind of a portal or they are going to rise from the dead. Right. Well, the point I was going to make is that to people without the technological know-how or the wording for it, somebody who is in suspended animation and stasis underground, then suddenly the chamber opens up and they come out again. Well, that's rising from the dead. That's the best way they could describe it. But we could be looking at literally rising from the dead. We don't know exactly. Yep, happened before. When yep. you know, you say, "Well, you know, Jesus rose from the dead, but he still had his body." Well, the, when 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 Jesus was crucified, a, a worldwide, you know, a big earthquake happened. It was recorded around the world, pretty much. The earth, yep. the sky went dark for three hours. A lot of people think it's in the brew passed on the the, the lee side of us, but uh, the dead came out. You go check your Bible, folks. The dead were raised and walked around Jerusalem testifying. Yeah, that's documented. There is a bunch of sightings of people that had been, yeah, actually quite a while dead, suddenly walking around the streets, and everybody's like, whoa, isn't that so-and-so? I thought he died like two months ago. He's uh, dead. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, isn't, that jo- isn't that Joseph? My gosh. Mm-hmm. You know, he's been dead a thousand years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, and again, this is this is all really creepy. So whichever angle you're coming from it is extremely creepy. And then you look at the story. Okay, what, what Cre- other Old Testament creepy, stories do we have about giants? We've got Goliath and his four brothers. So David picks up five stones. Okay, I'm going to wipe out five giants. I got my sling. God's on my side. These giants don't have a chance. He takes a shot. He hits Goliath right in the forehead. Goliath falls over on his face. Now, the question is, did that shot actually kill him or did it just stun him? But the, the interesting part is what he did next is he ran over, pulled out Goliath's own huge sword, and cut his head off with it. And how many times have you heard stories about, like, zombies and other undead where the only way you can stop them is to get rid of the head? Mm-hmm. And here's, here's a really good point. David carried that head, according to Jewish history, David carried that head in a burlap bag. Mm-hmm. Until he was made king at Hebron. Yep. Now that's a while. Yeah, so yeah that and, was, and, that was know, a couple of years. Just separate from the Bible, if you go back and you look at all the uh, Eastern European traditions about vampires and stuff, if they wanted to get rid of, rid of one of them, they had to cut its head off and burn its body. Yep. Just separating the head from the body wasn't even enough. They had to make sure they got rid of the body, or it somehow <laughs> could get its head back and start over again. So yeah, they were like, you know, really, really careful about how they dealt with these things, because there are only like certain prescribed methods that could actually get rid of them. But we're digressing a little bit too much here. Now we're on Transylvanian vampires. But to get back to what we're talking about, uh, you know, we uh, we came in here, and God had already promised uh, where the uh, the Israelites were going to move into eventually. So Satan knew where they were going to. And he had about 300 years to set up some obstacles for them there. So when they came wandering into the Holy Land and did a little recon, they went, Oh, geez, these guys are, like, enormous. We look like grasshoppers compared to them, you know. Yeah. There's, like, giants here, man. I thought they were all gone. So, you know, it, one of the things that always uh, interested me is how exactly did they get rid of these giants? And I don't think we've got a really good answer for that, you know. Neutron bombs, poison, whatever it was that they were using, they managed to do it. The the point that we're coming to here <laughs> next, though, is that at the time that they managed to dispose they of They rope them and behead them. <laughs> yeah, well, to be it, whatever it was that they did, burn them at the stake, and you know, impale them. Behead them. Uh, they, they they somehow got rid of them, and uh, apparently some of them, uh, very small pockets of them, were still in the Holy Land for a while. Because then you have you know Goliath and and his buddies showing up later on. But the majority of them seem to have high tailed it out of there, and those are the ones that we're interested in. And we know for. You know, as as I was telling you guys during the beginning of the show, some of them definitely either were or went from there to Egypt and were working with the Egyptians afterwards and even became parts of the royal family. And it may be possible that that's how they got over here 
from the Levant by being tied into the Egyptians, who were great shipbuilders and experts at navigation, and uh, may have made it over here that way. Now, the other option is that they could have taken the long way around. And what do I mean by the long way around? Well, they could have gone overland. They could have just spread up into Asia, went uh, you know east in Asia until they got up into Siberia, Wait until it was cold, got across the Arctic ice over into Alaska, and came down that way. But it doesn't look like that's what happened. And here's one of the reasons that I think that they didn't do that. Um, we've got a lot of archaeological evidence of there being mounds, megaliths, and the same sort of stu stuff up in Siberia and Eastern Asia that's all over the rest of the world. But we also have some more recent information from that area that archaeologists have dug up about what the uh, the Russian mythological and archaeological experts call the Kurgans. Now, the Kurgans were supposedly another tribe of giants. And mm -hmm. if you go to Moscow today, you can see a statue of one that's like 25 feet tall. Now, the Kurgans, they know from their expansion whether they were giants or enormous humans or whatever the heck they were, from 4500 B.C. to 3750 B.C. were spreading westward into Eastern Europe and uh, took over most of Russia. So at the time that the giants that were in Canaan would have left that area, they would have been unable to move up into Asia because the Kurgans had all of it. And right. they were just notoriously incredibly ferocious. And as we know from looking at even the most vague and basic information on this subject, giants did not get along with each other. They were just as prone to kill each other as anybody else. So if you had one giant really powerful tribe in an area, they weren't very likely to let you know, immigrant giants from some other area. Let, let, me, let, me, let me interject the, 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 about that video we saw that I sent you. Uh, you can type in Kurgans on uh, YouTube, and uh, uh, you will see... K-U-R-G-A-N-S. Uh-huh. K-U-R-G-A-N-S. Uh -huh. You will see video of museums over in Russia and the Ukraine. Mostly it was... It was uh, Hungary was their was their main main place where they where they, they their headquarters, and uh, they've got museums there with beautiful swords. Uh, these things are the, the blades are five foot long, mm -hmm. and not just one. They've got dozens of them. They've got bows. The, the bows are the crazy things are over ten foot, mm -hmm. and they're in remarkable condition. They've got other swords that look similar to samurai swords with blades that are eight foot long. Mm -hmm. It's the and this this isn't stuff people made up. You can actually see the museum no. pieces with kids no, standing next to them. They're in the museums. Right. It's physically there. And to continue on with what I was saying now here, whether it was the Kurgans or whether it was the Canaanite giants, some tribe of giants went up and took over Europe, too. And they've actually got uh, good examples of the same sort of thing you're talking about, except they're battle axe heads. They've got them in a museum in uh, um, Denmark. Uh, the Danes have them. And they, the, the battle axe heads themselves, without the haft, weigh 150 pounds. There's no way in hell any human ever wielded these things. <laughs> they're enormous. Okay, so, you know, either they made these things just to impress the neighbors or giants made them. Okay, there's your two choices. And, again, you have the same megalithic structures. In Scandinavia, they have what they call the giant's throw. And these are like huge boulders, like, you know, the size of a, a, a station wagon or a minivan Volkswagen, that, are, yeah. that are like on top of another big boulder, and they've got – that it's sitting on top of. Without a modern-day crane, you could literally have not moved that top rock and picked it up to put it into place, much less had these other little rocks underneath it. And there's lots of examples of this. There's lots of examples of these megalithic structures. There's lots of examples of these mounds, the same kind of mounds that we've got over here in the central U.S. And what's also interesting about the area of Scandinavia, go back and look at their, their mythology, frost giants. What did frost giants look like? Oh, they were like three times the size of human. They were white. They had red hair, and they had blue eyes. Sound familiar? This is exactly what the paintings in the uh, the tomb of the royal architect in Egypt look like. And this is also the exact same description of the giants in North America. So yeah. whether or not it was the Canaanites, they match the description of what we ended up with over here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, they match Lovelock cave giants. And that's another thing. And let's get into that now, Dave. You take it away from here and uh, and talk a little bit about what may have happened as far as the Egyptians coming over to this part of the world sure. and possibly bringing the giants with them. Well, here, uh, let, let me, let me as, a, as a, a way into that, let me set the stage. 
Egypt was the superpower of the world. It was the trading superpower. It was the merchandise superpower. It, they were it. People from all over Europe came to Egypt to do business. Uh, the the reason that the giants didn't mess with the Egyptians it, 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 during the time of the Levant was there were too many of them. Now you got to remember. You got to remember Jericho. Mm-hmm. Now Jericho's over by the Dead Sea, and they're regular people. And when the, the twelve spies went into the land, they got to Jericho, and Rahab the harlot said, "We now they've been in the wilderness for forty years because the first ten of the spies didn't believe God's report that they could take them, and only mm-hmm. two did. So they spent forty years in the wilderness till all those guys died yeah. off. And the, the the woman at Jericho told them." We know about your God and what he did to the Egyptians. And the fear of you is upon us all. (laughs) Well, they they made arrangements for her when they attacked the city. She put out a red cloth, and she's in the lineage of Jesus. So uh, King David and Jesus. So the Lord's not as hard-hearted as he's been depicted. These folks that he had slaughtered in the Old Testament were giants. They were. They carried the Nephilim DNA. They were not ordained of God, and they were no way going to make it into heaven. And anybody that wants to dispute that, go back, listen to part one. There's 36 tribes, I gave the names of all of them, that are either Nephilim or Nephilim hybrids. Every single tribe that God told them to wipe out completely were on that list. That's right. So Egypt was a big deal, and even after the, the the exodus, Egypt became a big deal again. Now, here's a little uh, thing I found was interesting. Uh, the Greeks were excavating a site in in uh, that went back to antiquity and actually the time of the Levant. And when they dug down all the way down to it and they got the whole thing cleaned out, they looked up on the wall and there's a mosaic of the exodus. <laughs> and this is in Greece. And uh, this is public knowledge, folks. Uh, uh, I mean, I I read it in a paper somewhere. Uh, Then you go back to the Bible and you look, and it said there were people who came out in the Exodus who came out with the Israelites, the children of Israel, and then departed after uh, after, uh, uh, Moses smote the rock and the water came out at Horeb. They departed and went on their way. And these folks would have caught a ship and went on back to Greece. So the world's not as primitive as ever as as even our pastors have told us it was, and right. and uh, so let's move. Well, don't on to forget, the, you know, just to digress for a second, mm-hmm, just to take us mm-hmm. to the, the subject of Atlantis, which we'll be bringing up again. Um, it was it wasn't Plato that originally came up with the story. It was like his grandpa Solon, who was over in Egypt and was talking to one of the temple high priests about history, and this whole weird deal, and you know the Great Flood, and the, and the high priest said. Well, ha, 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 you you dumb Greeks are so recent, you don't know anything about history. That wasn't the only flood. There's been more than one great flood. Uh We started out last time talking about the first three verses of the Bible and how they've completely blown the translation. Mm -hmm. And even in other languages, they've used the the King James as a a guidepost. And the words haya, tohu, and vabohu, uh, are in there. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and, and the earth was Haya, and Tohu, and Vabohu, and the waters covered the face of the deep, and the firmament rested upon the waters. Well, in English, that would be, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the and Haya, the, the earth, it was uh, completely desolate, or a wasteland, pardon me, a wasteland. No, pardon me, I'm, I'm, I'm getting confused here. Haya, has, it means had become. The, uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth had become tohu, utter chaos, and vohu, a wasteland. And yeah. the waters covered the face of the deep, and deep space rested upon the waters. That's a destructive flood, and there's there's your pyramids, folks. There's all your yeah. stuff. Uh, uh, some of it was, was post-Genesis 1. A lot of it was pre-Genesis 1, including the dinosaurs, a lot of that stuff that... Uh, so it's a you know, am I a creationist? You bet. Uh, am I? A I guess new, the point that I'm trying to make here for people that are interested in looking at the biblical timeline mm-hmm. is that before 
the great biblical flood when the giants got wiped out. There was another cataclysm even before that, is what yeah. the Egyptians were saying. Yeah, I'm an old earth creationist. I believe this is an old earth and that man's the one that's new and started in Genesis 1. Amen, I brother. I believe the stuff that was around before that wasn't us. Nope. And that's what the fossil record says. Hey, there's Heidelberg Man. Hey, there's Australopithecus. Hey, there's Neanderthals. Those aren't humans. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, well, so actually, the Neanderthal, I think... To... Neanderthal, I think, was an ape. Uh, well, you know, we've got some Neanderthal genes that are close enough they could mate with us, but that still doesn't mean that they're humans or some humanoid thing. Mm -hmm. And we don't even know what they look like. A lot of the reconstructions could be completely wrong. Danny Vendermini did uh, head paintings commissioned based on the idea that if you take a Neanderthal skull and you build it up uh, on the model of a human, you'll get something that looks vaguely human. But suppose they didn't look like humans. Let's use a model of an ape and build its face up that way. And interestingly, the artistic depiction of that matches almost exactly what witnesses in North America are seeing when they're talking about type 2 Bigfoots. And right. this is quite common knowledge in the Bigfoot community at this point. So, you know, again, be suspicious of the way things are being presented to you from science. But let's go back to what we've got for actual well, archaeological yeah, well, history and maybe able to tie this together because we've got a connection with the Egyptians right here in North America. Right. Let's, let's give them the, if you want to see a, a picture of what that would have looked like, there's a book that came out called Them and Us, T-H-E-M and Us. And you'll see the, uh, the, 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 the depiction of Neanderthal as an ape. It's, it's hard to say it wasn't. An, I, I've never seen or pictured a human with a three-inch tall upper lip. <laughs> and, Which is what you get described as Bigfoot all the time. Well, the distance between their nose and their upper lip is wrong. It's like right. two or three times as much as what a human has. Right. Mango. You take away the slit eyes and you, and you give them a hooded nose and you got yourself a type 2 Bigfoot. And yeah, just for the benefit of the audience there, I'm going to be posting the even better version of that, which is redone by the Bigfoot Outlaws to conform to what people actually see. Cool. rather than the notion that v uh, Vendermini had. Because, uh, you know, just for everybody's purposes of knowledge on this, Danny Vendermini is not a Bigfoot guy. He doesn't believe in Bigfoot. He did this completely separate from the Bigfoot community and actually stumbled on possibly a really good answer <clears throat> for what some of these things might be or mm -hmm. be related to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I want to get us back on track here again sure. now. From Ready. the Levant to the wild, wild west, how did those giants get over here? Did they come over here? Uh, you know, overland, did they come out across the ice sheet? Did they sail here? There's a lot of pictures of them in the uh, Egyptian tombs there with the architect, not only of building things, but of being on boats, uh, the, right. you know, classic Egyptian boats going around. So they knew what boats were and how to get across water on them. Sure. Do you think they sailed over here to North America with the Egyptians? Uh, I think that they came independently of them and with them. Okay. I think I think that they're that the, the majority of what we uh, uh, they found the skeletons of in 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 uh, the Upper Appalachian and in New England, Upper Appalachian Plateau in New England, the mound builders that they're, they're what we call them. Uh, I think that they they uh, basically the the group that are uh, east of the Great Plains. I believe that they sailed from uh, the area around Haifa and Beirut. I believe they set sail from there. They sailed through the, the uh, uh, across the Mediterranean and uh, out the Strait of Gibraltar. And uh, it's not hard to get to North America from there. I believe they landed in New Jersey and went straight up onto the, the Appalachian Plateau in, in western Pennsylvania. And uh, they also landed in uh, New England. And that's where they settled. There was plenty of game. And those are where the megalithic structures and all that stuff is, while there is not much of that kind of stuff in the eastern Rockies or the Great Plains area, except for Minnesota. So mm -hmm. I, I personally think that they, that they got there that way, but then I also believe the ones from the west came with the Egyptians. And, and uh, you know, I, I was, uh, I've always been a history buff. I was a history major in college. And uh, that music, you know, what do I do for a living? Math. Whew, boy, that was my weakest subject. But as soon as I found out it was money, I got better at it. Uh, the uh, history, I, I, when I got to Arizona, I lived there for the desert southwest for a little over a decade. And uh, uh, one of the stories that fascinated me was the Vaqueros 
uh, I guess you you they had another name for them. It was similar. It was kind of a cross between conquistador and vaquero. So I, I guess these guys probably carried a lance and a whip more than a rope. Mm-hmm. But uh, they uh, they sighted a uh, between Highway 8 and Highway 10 in western Arizona, out uh, northeast of Yuma, a Spanish galleon in the late 1700s. <laughs> in the, in the right out in the middle of the desert. Out in the middle of the desert, there's a Spanish galleon. Well, and here's another funny story. Uh, about 60 years later, two American cowboys, and uh, well, I guess it was more than that, about uh, 80 years later, two American cowboys were out there and, ro- and roped a flying uh, uh, pterodactyl. Flying lizard. <laughs> so figure that one out. That, that, that's a piece of history kind of spooked me. That whole area is really scary. Now, to take people back now, at the time that that presumably the Egyptians showed up here, that whole area out there was actually connected to the ocean by a big inland sea. Right. And like you were saying, you could sail basically right up to that area, right off the ocean. Yeah, you and weren't very other... far from you weren't very far from Blythe, California. I, I believe it went all the way up to Chocolate Mountains. So you know, and, and to get to the Grand Canyon and the, and the Egyptian uh, remnants that have been found there, and we'll get into that in a minute. All you had to do was you, you get to the head of the river that's feeding this huge delta. Uh, that you've come in through the Sea of Cortez, and you simply follow the water, and if you've gotten on the west side, which was the most easily easily to traverse, you would have got come in through uh, straight up through Blythe, and then on up uh, past Las Vegas, and then around the north side of what's now Lake Mead, and then uh, boom, within just a few days' march, you are at that point on the north side of the Grand Canyon. And you're standing within a short amount of time directly over the area where the the uh, Egyptian uh, fortifications and, and uh, mummies are at. Right. And there's that one area of the Grand Canyon that's got all the weird Egyptian names on it, and nobody's allowed to go there. Yeah. That, that seriously suddenly, enough. Sud- suddenly, uh, uh, all of this hit the papers in in that area, and even even made the Los Angeles paper. I've seen clippings. And about uh, the, the, the the giants and the Egyptians that were found in the Grand Canyon, et cetera. And then our beloved Smithsonian got involved. <laughs> and, and and everything went back there for further study, and the area was closed off. Yeah, it, that area is now closed to the public mm-hmm. of our largest national park, well, Canyon Park, is now closed to the public. And... Uh, that is all sealed off, and they've done away with the walkways and everything, stairs that were built to accommodate folks to getting there. They've done, they've done away with it all. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they got I understand, and, the only way to get in there now would be uh, by the river, and they keep an eye on that area. So if you try to do that, they'd catch you. Yeah, that, you can't get to it from the river. You've got to rappel down to it. It's That thing was giant-proof. And the folks that built it evidently built with wood stairways or ladders to get to that. But Mm -hmm. it was an ongoing long-term deal, and there are rumors that there are openings to that on the north side in the Kaibab Plateau, Mm -hmm. that there are ways out. And to give did. people a little bit more background than what we're talking about, a lot of the people that are interested in giants or Bigfoot have heard about uh, Princess Winnemucca, the Paiute Indians, and Lovelock Cave, and the red-haired giants that were living there that were, you know, just horrible monsters eating the Paiutes, uh, couldn't be dealt with. And finally, they had to catch them all in the cave, set a pile of wood on fire at the beginning of a, opening of the cave, and the smoke went in and choked them all to death, uh, you know, is how uh, the story goes. Well, at the time that this was going on, that cave was sitting right on the shore of this giant lake that we're talking about the Egyptians sailing in on. That lake isn't there anymore, but it's it very well documented that at that time it was. Yes, that this that these this this very well could have been uh, a mutant a mutiny, kind of like Powell and his men had when they were going down the Grand Canyon. Some of them decided we're not going to do any walking. We yep. walked as far as we're going to go, and we're not going to leave the water here. Yep. And we're going to stay here, and then they reverted to their old cannibalistic ways. Yep. And and uh, these very well may have been part of the crew that came over from 
not only from Egypt and, and not only there, but you get the, these are elongated skull rascals. That's the right. difference between these and the ones in the on the east coast and the eastern United States. These had elongated skulls, and they're, they have also been found on Catalina Island, mm-hmm. and L.A. Marzulli has covered that. And those skulls, of course, our beloved Smithsonian came in and did away with, uh, carted them, most of them off. But the museum has found a few skulls since then that they refused to su- submit. And I have seen close-up documentation on those photos, etc. And Marzulli's got some stuff on those, too. They're still there in that museum. Now, I think they charge you now or something to look at them, but, and you're not right. able to handle them. But and again, this is as what we had mentioned earlier on in the show that L.A. Marzulli had tentatively identified as the Anakim, one of the tribes of the uh, the Nephilim. Mm-hmm. Uh, apparently, were the ones that were working with the Egyptians, and here's the same area where the Egyptians supposedly came to, and here we're finding their skulls in the same area. So, right. really, what it looks like what you're saying, Dave, is that there there may have been two, at least two, separate and distinct invasions by the giants of North America. There could have been a whole different group that came over, like well, you know, from from right. Northern Europe, and came in that way, and then there was a different group that came in with the Egyptians. Well, I don't know if they came from Northern Europe or whether, whether I'm sure they resupplied there. I think I personally believe there were giants throughout that entire region, and the only reason that we're hearing about the ones in in, in Palestine or the Promised Land is that's the part the part that that God had promised to His people. Right. So, uh, you know, so I directly involved in the narrative, it was you know, of course, incumbent on them to mention the fact that there was a whole bunch of giants here, and we had to kick their butts out and before we could take over. Yeah, you know, we still got the same megalithic structures and the same kind of thing all over Europe that we find in the United States. So exactly. there's no reason to believe that those that they're you know plus plus the Kurgans, etc. There's no reason to believe that the entire that entire part of the world, including parts of China. Which my God, that I've seen the 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 the, the amphitheater they found underground. That yeah. There's no way we even possess tools today that it could could have carved that out. It's and an don't amph- forget, folks, uh, for those that are into archaeology, it wasn't that long ago that the uh, Chinese found a whole bunch of seven to nine foot tall mummies with red hair, appeared to be white people, half a group hacks out in the Gobi Desert. Right. <clears throat> uh, these these things are were the, the giants had reappeared post post Noah's flood. When I talk about the flood, I quit calling it the flood now. I call it Noah's flood or Genesis flood or or floods before that. Because we have to keep in mind the Genesis flood of of Genesis 1. Pardon me, Genesis 1. So there's Genesis 1 flood, then there's Noah's flood. So the rainbow really does have great significance when God says, I'm not going to do the flood deal anymore. Yeah, next time I'm going to burn the earth. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, God. <laughs> no, 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 well, but he's he's going to come for his people first. Oh, okay, good. Had me worried there for a second. Yeah, I, okay. I, you know, we we go up, they come down, so or they come out. So, uh, you know, the the so one now, thing. Again, that, if we had, if we had these guys established, let's say let's follow your theory. Let's say some of them were just like jerks and didn't want to deal with the Egyptians anymore, and just went, nah, we're done. We'll go do our own thing. We'll live here. We'll eat the locals. You know, well, and I, and I screw, screw you guys. Yeah. We don't want to play anymore. Well, yeah. they spread all over the Southwest, and right. you've got all the local Indian tribes there telling stories about these same giants doing these same depredations on their tribes. And as I was talking to Caveman not too long ago, Correct. a lot of you will remember this. He was talking about how there had been, in their mythology, the hero twins, and the hero twins had showed up and helped them fight the giants and chase them out of their area. And according to their legends, they chased the giants north. Mm-hmm. Into the area where the trees were giant and there was always snow on top of the mountains. That's how mm-hmm. far they chased them before they quit chasing them. But the interesting thing in, in, to keep in mind here is that in their mythology, the reason that they won this war, because they were on the losing end of the stick for a long time, things were going badly for them, was because these two hero twins had showed up to help them. And according to Cape Man, and I'll virtually quote what he said, this is what white uh, Western people would think of as demigods like Perseus and Hercules. They also were gigantic in stature, but for some reason they helped the local natives fight against these other giants and chase them out of there. I think they were angels. And it could have been. We I think they know. were angelic. I think they were they were God's angelic, and and he sent them to help. And there's other reasons because of what I'll mention here in a little while about Utah and, and some other things. God loves people. And even if they don't know him and even if they're not, if, if they don't have a revelation of him, 
he's a good God. And, you know, there's, uh, you know, there's so many examples of angels showing up. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, it says, be careful to entertain strangers, so for in so doing, you entertain angels unaware. And, you know, the tribes that things have not gone well for them were the ones who had the same word for stranger as they did for enemy. Mm-hmm. And the tribes who are still around today didn't. And they greeted strangers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Did don't they, forget the uh, the old weird custom of them holding up their hand. They got translated into uh, Western filmography as they're holding up their hand saying how. Uh, they were holding up their hand to make the guy on the opposite end hold up his hand so they could count fingers. If you had six fingers, you were an enemy and they wouldn't deal with you. Where did no, they they like they, they, yeah, they, they meant run for your life. Yeah, exactly. You're on the menu. You may not be able to tell exactly how big he is at a distance, but if you're close enough to count fingers, you know whether you should run or not. That's right. Run and hide. The, uh, uh, you know, at least this, it's, uh, I, th- I think it's interesting that uh, the Four Corners area, I don't believe that was the eastern giants that moved into that area, I believe it was these western ones. I think you may be right about that because there seemed to be some differences between the way they acted and uh, what they were building in those two different areas, and mm-hmm. as well as the physiological differences in the skulls that you're mentioning. That seems to point to that, you know, if they were related, they were two different species of the same critter. I, I personally believe that the that the uh, that the, the the ones that were in the eastern United States, the, I can't say we're all of them because who you know what do I know? This is just the opinion yeah. I formed by looking into it a whole bunch. I believe that the uh, but what, what does you know that that in a in a dollar I'll get you a cup of coffee. The uh, <laughs> the the uh, it's it's my humble opinion, you know, and they're. They're like belly buttons. We all got them, and they don't serve adults very much. But I'll share the 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 uh, my humble opinion that 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 you didn't get a lot of of uh, uh, sagittal crests on the giants that were in the eastern United States and Canada. Mm-hmm. I believe that the 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 ones that were on the west side, I believe that they were more pure DNA Nephilim. Mm-hmm. Now you know how they here's survive. an interesting story that I can use to back that up for you, Dave. Uh, this this comes from the Native American tribes of the Iroquois Confederation carries this around. A lot of the tribes in there still have it, and the Choctaw have it too. That there was a big, massive issue out on the the west coast, and it may have been a volcano or something. And a bunch of the tribes had to leave that area and move east. And when the tribes in question here, which you know probably ended up being several tribes further on in the future where we're at now, um, when they came up against the edge of the Mississippi River, there was a tribe of giants already sitting there that wanted to go across and couldn't. And the reason they couldn't go across is because there were these other giants that weren't part of their tribe on the east side of the Mississippi that were incredibly nasty and they couldn't make a deal with them, so they were just stuck there. And when all these Indians came rolling up, they went, whoa, whoa, what are you talking about? And they said, well, yeah, you know, these are the red-haired giants that were like seven to nine feet tall that they were talking to. And they said, there's these other guys over on the other side of the river here that are like twice as big as us. We're talking 15 to 18 feet. And they had the double rows of teeth. They had the six fingers and six toes. They ate everybody else who was smaller than them. So the, the legend is that the Indians actually teamed up with these smaller giants from the west, made war on these bigger giants, and chased their butts down the Mississippi to the south, never to be seen again. And that's how they ended up over in the central part of the U.S. Now, whether this was the remnant of the mound builders or if the giants they brought in with them became the mound builders, at this point we really don't know. But it's interesting this legend seems to confirm that there were, in fact, two different tribes of giants, and the one of them even teamed up with the local natives to get rid of the other one because they're even more vicious and nasty. Right. I, I, I personally believe that the, the ones with the elongated skulls, the, the, the anicum, is that what you call them? Yeah, the anicum. Yeah, I personally believe that that those were remnants of the Nephilim, that they were they were more pure than Og, and and I believe that they had joined forces with the Egyptians. Now the Bible doesn't depict this, so I can't I don't have any scripture to to, to tie it to, and I usually look for that. 
But uh, I do know that at some time they made connection with them because of what's left in these tomb paintings in Egypt of yeah. these elongated skulls. Exactly. So, and the people they're depicting, and this again includes Akhenaten, Tutankhamun, that whole weird royal family that decided to get mm-hmm. rid of the multi-god worship and start worshiping one god. Ooh, that's kind of weird. Mm-hmm. And then they got overthrown by the priesthood. And he yeah, and it weren't our god. Kind of tossed <laughs> out again. No, but the point here is that these, uh, they, were, they were strictly not conforming to the way the Egyptians did things. When they managed to gain power, they changed everything around and whizzed off all the humans that were working underneath them and swiftly got booted back out again. And, uh, again, these guys looked exactly like the Paraka skull guys. They had these weird right. elongated skulls. And they didn't have the double rows of teeth and stuff, but they had these weird elongated-looking skulls. And, you know, so, and, and where did they come from down in South America? Well, once they got to, the, you know, the West Coast, all they had to do was march down through Central America and Bingo Bango, they were down in South America causing trouble. Right. Well, not only that, but if they came from Egypt, they would have sailed around. I mean, there there was no uh, Panama Canal. No. They they came up that way. I believe right. they were there. That I believe that they that that those are the ones that were in South America in Peru, mm-hmm. and that that uh, that's the ones that uh, that. Uh, Tim Al- Alberino, is that his name? Yeah. Yeah. And and Marzuli and Moorhead, Ron Moorhead went down there with him. Yeah. And and uh, Steve Quayle and the whole bunch. I believe that's what they're they're talking about. In Peru is these same ones with the elongated skulls. Mm-hmm. And and uh that 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 whole culture there and in Bolivia is the same type of group that uh, we ended up in in, in uh, the Grand Canyon. Now, the the, uh, the that eventually came to the Inland Sea. Now that 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 Inland Sea is a fact. It was there, yeah. And and it it was there until at least the the late 1500s, early uh, mid 1600s. You know, it's somewhere in there because the, in the in the late 1700s they saw a Spanish galleon out in the desert that was hundreds of miles from from an existing ocean. So we we've, we've had we've definitely had some some geological Shifting and changing in uh, in uh, the. Well, as far as that uh, goes, where I'm standing right now was under 200 feet of water not that long ago. Mm-hmm. Go look it up, guys. Glacial Lake Missoula. Yeah. yeah, the whole the whole Bitterroot Valley was a big lake, and then one of the mountain tops broke, and everything came gushing out and caused mm-hmm. havoc all over the place. Well, and and if you ever want to go to Navajo land, uh, there you you go on uh, the road down through. Uh, Tuba City, Mexican hat, Tuba City, and all of that. And you stop on the side of the road and get out. There'll be a little seashell. You're at 5,500 foot elevation. There'll be mm-hmm. a little seashell every three or four inches. Everywhere. <laughs> Everywhere. Yeah. yeah. A little seashell. Every three, every three or four inches, there'll be a little seashell about the size of a dime. And they're everywhere. I don't mean just where you stop your car, I mean everywhere. It's the bottom of an ocean. That's oh the draining of that ocean is what caused the Grand Canyon. Mm-hmm. Now let's let's look a little bit more intently at uh, South America here, where we have all of these old cultures that were all building megalithic pyramids, and all had these weird leaders that had blood rituals going on, and we're all talking about giants being around there. Mm-hmm. And basically being in charge of them. Uh, you know, let me, like, let me, how many let me, of these parallels do you have to see before it starts looking like it's the same thing all over the place? Let's 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 talk about let's talk about uh, North America first, and then we can we can stick to that. Uh, okay. Because I, I want to talk about the Chinese, and I want to talk about the Minoans, okay. and I want to talk about the Aztecs. Now the Aztecs. Were their legend is, and I believe it. Their legend is that they came out of Utah and that they were there approximately prior to 1000 BC, and that they were in Utah, and that that, that was their area, and that uh, when the giants came in, obviously these ones with the elongated skulls, they picked up and moved to Mexico. And where they settled was an island in the middle of a lake, and they built canals. These people were magnificent canal builders. And why would you build canals that have that are so deep? 
instead of streets, and they were deep, deep canals. Mm-hmm. Well, they'd had enough of the giants. They pretty much made their, their situation giant-proof. And when, uh, uh, now when Bizarro first entered uh, Peru, uh, his records show that they found skulls that were from the eye socket to the back of the skull anywhere from 36 to 42 inches. Those are big boys. Those are, and they know the distance because in the, the uh, report, they had one of these skulls and they were using it for a sword holder. They were putting their rapiers into the eye sockets and the back of the sword blade was barely touching the back of the skull. So that's how they know the length. And and they uh, the scientists today have estimated, or in the last, I don't know, 50 years, have estimated that that was at least an 18-footer. Yeah, I would say at least. Now, if they were common enough for Pizarro and his men to find them, then they were common enough to be known by the natives if those skulls were still around. Mm-hmm. So now we're now let's move on up to the Aztecs. The Aztecs, uh, they uh, they built that uh, their city, canals and everything. And when Cortez came in and they burnt their ships. And uh, the the the, uh, the Aztecs saw that they burnt their ships. Uh, they knew they were in for a long siege, and so mm-hmm. they started out friendly. Didn't end up that way. And when things turned bad, uh, the stories that I heard. Now I saw this on the the show with the forensic geologist, and again I cannot remember his name, but uh, uh, they he had he had talked about this, but I had heard this previously from some Mexican-Americans and some folks from Mexico, that that was the legend of, uh, that they're actually Aztecs uh, mm-hmm. lineage, and uh, that they had come from Utah. And so, and that, that they had, uh, uh, there was a mountain in Utah that basically resembled a huge boulder. I, I don't know what the other side of it looked like, but uh, the forensic geologist showed it on his show. And the the legend is that when when Cortez and them were raiding, that that the, the, the it was still in their memory they'd come from Utah, and it, I, evidently they knew that the giants had been cleared out. I personally think the Lord sent a plague in about the year 1500 because they all seem to have died out in that era. But uh, uh, they took their treasures up there and they hid them under this stone in a set of caves that they knew about. It was in the 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 oral tradition of their tribe, the Aztecs, mm-hmm. and that they had had excavated under there and that they had these 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 uh, subterranean areas underneath this huge huge boulders the size of an aircraft hangar or bigger bigger than an aircraft hangar and. Uh, they took their. They sent the, their people there to take their treasure and hide it there, and then they built a water system that filled the area around there completely. And this has all been submerged in water. Now the geologist that had the TV show, he and some other divers tried to go in there, and the story is the legend that they were telling about is that, and this was like a cowboy legend or a, a mountain area legend, that there had been folks that, that from the local community and from afar off that had come with scuba gear and tried to dive in there and had mysterious things happen to them. You know, Kumbo and Bear talk about suddenly your, your batteries go dead uh-huh. on your, you know, around Bigfoot. Well, these, these people were in there and suddenly their tanks didn't work. Oh, God. S- suddenly their, their, their instruments are, are gone crazy. Mm-hmm. Suddenly, their 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 batteries have died in their cameras. Suddenly, the lights are gone out, and there have been more than a few people have died uh, in those in those areas. There have been, I guess, they drug quite a few of them out. I don't know if they got them all, but uh, when when this, I can see his face. I can't think of his name. This forensic geologist, when when he and that group, uh, they had some bad things happen, and they got the heck out of there. And uh, matter of fact, uh, uh, I think they were even denied the opportunity to dive there. And, and what he showed was some footage from somebody else. I can't remember for sure, but I know I know the legend, and I know that that, that, that supposedly the Aztec treasure is there. That they came prior to the 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 uh, 
1500 AD, or pardon me, after 1500 BC, excuse me, 1500 BC is when the giants came, that's the Levant, and and it took them a few hundred years to get to Utah, but when they did, uh, that's when, uh, well, actually, I, I think it could have been the Egyptian, the ones that came with the Egyptians, and it would have not taken them that long, but at any rate, uh, somewhere around uh, 1,000 to uh, 1,200 to 1,000 B.C., they moved out. And uh, uh, the time of the conquistadors and the, the uh, and their their uh, their raiding of the Aztecs, they sent their treasure back. So we've got that tie to Utah that predated the giants, their existence there. You you, you predate the giants with the Anasazi, the ancient the Anasazi is simply Navajo for ancient ones, I believe. Uh, some of the other Pueblo tribes go back almost to the, that time period. Or, or do, uh, I think the Puebla tribes do, and uh, but they they all have in their in their traditions their history they got bad encounters, and uh, I think the Anasazi were the ones that were the most isolated, and had the worst experiences, and funny uh, f- uh, you know coincidentally, in 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 a in a odd weird, weird kind of funny, uh, Bob Garrett. When he talked to Wes about his experiences there at Mesa Verde, I've been in that area, and how he camped out and he, he heard the moccasins on the, you know, people that re- weren't really there, and he heard the moccasins, uh, you know, people people walking and running and and different things. Uh, I don't think those were 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 good, uh, as as benevolent as he th- thinks they were. I I think that that's some of the leftover and residues of that area, the Anasazi and the the, the Holocaust that happened to them, that that uh, Steve Quayle and 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 all these and Tom Horn and his group are talking about and holding this conference in Branson on the tenth, or pardon me, in September the uh, you look it up, I think it's the twenty third, and September twenty third, uh, I, I had my meetings confused. At any rate, that's going to be a good one, and I think they're they've got just a few spaces left but that's uh that's the, they were brought in by a guy named Mahuti who had worked with the Bureau of Indian Affairs he's in his 80s now and basically doesn't care and he's blowing the whistle on the Smithsonian and a whole lot of stuff he called uh, because these guys have done the work on the giants he called them in and said that, that the the elders of several tribes wanted to meet with them, and they met in Chaco Canyon. And, uh, of course, you can see all this on their videos. But uh, <clears throat> that uh, they're shamans who, uh, <clears throat> uh, me having a background in deliverance, I'm not really crazy about quoting them, but I can tell you this much. They truly believe they've been, in, that, 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 number one, physically the giants are buried there. So make sure that you're kind to everyone. Uh, safety first, last, and always. Pay it forward. Don't be mean to people if you don't have to be. Uh, don't flip off the mountain giant. Don't poke dog man with a stick. Don't punt the puck, would you? And for God's sake, whatever you do, do not hug the Wookiee.